Okay, that gives me the possibility to welcome everybody to the tutorial number two, Tactile Internet with Human in the Loop. Um, I hope everybody can hear and see me. Um, next to the screen that I have here with the video of myself with a little corner down here, I have the Zoom uh, webinar chat on my secondary screen as well as something for questions. Um, if you have questions um, during my talk, you can post some questions there. I will read them out loud and then um, maybe if I have them, give you an, an right answer to that. So um, for the agenda today, um, we have the following. Um, we are two people. One is Gerd Fettweiss and the other one is me, Frank Fitzek. And I will start with the introduction uh, to CETI, which is the Center for Tactile Internet introducing challenges of the tactile internet and tech, uh, technologies for the tactile internet. And then we have half an hour break. I hope this is okay. And after that, um, Gerhard will take over for the future steps. Um, if you want to have further information, you see here my Twitter account or um, the YouTube um, channel where you um, have also some videos for the stuff that you will see here. If you want to have more information about this, just go there and subscribe to the channel. Um, there are a lot of demos um, according to the tactile internet and other technologies. Also, our websites are here if you are seeking for more information. So um, let's start with the main topic, which is the tactile internet. Um, we have this at Mendham with human in the loop. And we are lucky that since last year, um, we have a seven year project on the tactile internet and we have the Center for Tactile Internet here at TU Dresden, which are more or less 100 researchers now working on this topic. Um, next to the, our Center for Tactile Internet, there are other universities already working on the topic. And um, the IEEE has gathered a subgroup working on this, the IEEE is um, working group 19 and 18, um, the subgroup one, uh, dot one for tactile internet standardization working group is currently meeting. And if you, if now the conferences are allowed again, what you will see is there will be more of these meetings really discussing this. There's some special session at the conference where you can submit your papers and um, this, working group has given already a definition about what is this tactile internet, right? We know what the internet is, what this tactile internet, what makes it so um, important. I would just read the definition, which is a network or network of networks for remotely accessing, perceiving, manipulating, or controlling real or virtual objects or processed in perceived real time by humans or machine. This definition has, of course, um, elaborated over the years. Um, the part of the humans has um, come in lately. Um, before that, it was more oriented for low latency communication for cyber physical systems, which is still a part of that. But the humans in the loop, this is something that is interesting for us. This group is headed by Miriam Zinzek, and um, she's organizing it very well. So keep an eye on that. In our Center for Tactile Internet, we have already three professors um, working um, also in this subgroup, like Gerhard or Eckhard Steinbach from TU Munich. And what is very important at this uh, point in time is to make clear that this tactile internet is not just a low latency or ultra low latency communication. And it's not just something for electrical engineers or computer scientists. There's way more to learn about this. And it's not just a little bit more on cyber physical systems. Having said that, let me try to elaborate on this and give you a little bit an idea what we think what it should be. Um, if you hear the two terms tactile and internet, we all know that there is the internet and the use case of the internet was really to democratize the access to information for everybody independently of location and time. So this makes you, um, or you get access to all the possible information with Wikipedia, with YouTube. And um, I think with that, they did a really good job. Now the tactile internet is similar to that. It also wants to democratize something, but here not the information. It wants to democratize the access to skills and expertise. So to promote equity for people of different genders, ages, culture, backgrounds, or physical limitations. Imagine you had a skill, you lost it, or you never had a skill, you want to learn it. How can the technology help you with that? And if you think it through that um, we could build such an internet, such a tactile internet, 
then we would have for sure impact on the way we will learn in the future. We will have an impact how we get older, how we deal with, um, with medical situations or the situation how we work, right? In the uh, Center for Tactile Internet, we have um, three main um, use cases developed for that. One is telemedicine, and um, this is not just remotely uh, remote operation. It's more or less how do we teach the next generation of doctors um, then the Internet of Skills, how will the young people learn, even older people, but especially young people. And um, in industry, the cohabitation of machines and humans. What can we do there? And through the talk here, I will tell you a little bit how expertise can go from one side to the other side, from the machine to the human, from the human to the machine, or at the same time on a mutual way. So... Um, to start with, I would give you one classical example. How can we get one skill from a human to a machine? Uh, imagine you are gifted. You can do something very good. Um, for example, working with wood or with other things. Then um, what you will do is you would like to give it to a robot, right? Because the robot could help you to repeat the task many times. But before the robot can actually do what you can, you have to convey your skill to the other side. And you can teach a real robot or you can even teach a virtual robot as long as they learn it, then they can take the program and share it among the robots, right? The easiest way to do that is you would give the expert, which has this blue ring around itself and trying to understand um, how to get this skill to the machine and say, here's an Xbox controller or any kind of controller and say, try it out. Now, if the expert is an expert on a given thing, like working on Word, he will not be an expert how to use the, um, the controller for that, right? Even programming the robot on the other side is very um, problematic for him. He's really good in the one thing, and this he would like to, to do. So you could do this now and try to give uh, this kind of Xbox controller, as I said, and we found out some years before that um, this is not a very good idea because people, not all of them, know how this movement of the Xbox controller has an impact on their uh, machine. And um, we found other things like this picture um, from Japanese colleagues somewhere that um, really said, okay, maybe there's a humanoid robot and I just make my movements and the humanoid robot will do it. Now, if you um, have seen the robot before, it, he doesn't look really like that, right? But if you would have something like this, very interesting. Now, to give it a little bit of spin, I found a video from, a, um, from the university in the US. Here you see that where the movement of the head of the human is um, just uh, um, given over to a, to a cyber physical uh, machine on the left. And um, this is not our work, as I said, and we found it on the internet. Um, very interesting. Um, this is just the head movement. Um, we worked later on something similar, but we had the whole upper part um, of a robot with two arms, um, two hands with um, five fingers and a hat. And here you see um, a student of us um, moving. Um, there are some sensors um, now hidden in the jacket, in the glove. And uh, you can see here how he's steering um, the robot to um, groom himself a little bit. And whatever he see, what the robot can see, he can also see from the um, um, from his VR goggles, right? So later um, we have demonstrated this at the Mobile World Congress together with Deutsche Telekom in 2017, and um, all the movements. It was just another a better controller, right? Maybe that we could use um, to get the the excellence from the from the from the um, from the expert. So, and down here you see the, um, the CEO of Deutsche Telekom, who also had this one. I ch let's show you this a little bit more in detail. Here you see that um, he's moving and um, he has two sensors in the, in the um, hands. At the time we could not um, make it faster because he has other things to do on the stage. And he was presenting some um, new um, results from the company. But while he was doing it, the robot also did the same um, the same movement as he did at the time where there was also a 5G connection. Why this was important, we explain you later. 
So um, this kind of improved controller is something that um, we we would like to work on. Um, here you see another example. And last but not least, something for speed. And by this, you already see the, um, the problem, problems, right? A little bit, you see sometimes the latency between the human and the, the robot. That was something we had to deal with. Also, the physics of the robot arms were quite different to, to human bodies. Um, not surprisingly, but um, in order to get, make something very um, fast and so on, we had to do some tricks. That was beginning of um, um, uh, 2017, yeah. And um, there were some tests um, for this kind of robot. Now, um, if you do, if you have something like this, um, there are other things you could do. For example, here you see. Um, Sebastian again, he did the speed test before, and um, this was a world fair in China where he um, faked to be a doctor that could do over long distance um, some medical um, investigation on a human body. That was requested by a Chinese government that said um, that they would like to have the doctors in the cities but also make some um, minor. Um, investigation like ultrasound um, for uh, pregnant ladies um, over distance how this could be right so such an improved controller can have good um, um, good use cases and we should now look what we can use to convey the skills um, first let me go back a little bit what normally would be done to get a skill from a human to a um, to a robot like this this industrial arm and there are some stages where the expert um, will explain a computer scientist um, what the robot should do and the computer scientist will then produce software. So he programs that and they will test it out over time um, whether the robot will more or less do what the expert um, was expecting to do that. In the end of such a process, and the expert will mostly be not satisfied because he could do it better, but as the robot could, could do it multiple times and faster, and with less errors once it's at a satisfactory level, then um, this is the normal way. Problematic with this approach currently is that um, the robot arms has already a high price. Even they are dropping now dramatically um, in car manufacturing situations, I would say such a robot can easily cost 100k to up to millions. But this is not the price tag. The real price tag is this computer scientist who's really programming the robots. Depending on the industry, the factor um, that the programmers will cost more than the robot is between two and six. So if you have something in the car manufacturing, it, it's between two and three. If you have something for chip fabrication, it can go up to six. So this is very costly, first of all. Um, as I said, the price will drop dramatically for the um, for the robot arms, not for the programmer. So this ratio, this this balance, is um, will even be um, going higher and higher. So the question is, um, what can we do with that? Another problem what we see is if the if the robots will um, become less expensive this means there will be also more um, robots inside the um, in the fabrication process this means we would even need more of these programmers which we don't have so even if you had look at your university you will see that the people that can program such a thing um, they're not so many right and besides the fact that we don't have the programmers that it will cost money it also costs a lot of time it will take months three months in order to really get a skill into that until it's tested, until everybody will say that's okay to, to let it run in the fabrics and so on. So let's come back to this controller thing, right? So what we did in 2017 more or less was to say, okay, when we have this kind of um, improved controller, 
where we have, for example, some clothing with sensors um, in it, in the jacket, in the trousers, in the gloves, and on the hat. Maybe we could just perform our skill set and record this movement many times. And by using machine learning, we can produce the software automatically. So what we did is we, we got rid of the programmer in this chain and let just let the expert do it many times over and over again and just show it, right? At the time, we, um, we started to write the proposal for our center, but also started to have um, a startup here on campus called Wandelbots. And um, Wandelbots was also touring around with this idea. And what you see here um, is an example um, early 17 with um, Dietz, who is the CEO of Volkswagen. You see already he has this jacket on, sensors embedded, and he was performing a certain task. Not a very um, complicated skill. In this case, it was to use some loudspeakers and pressing it in the um, in a hole in the door. And you have to press with um, the right amount of um, forces so that the loudspeaker will not come back, but also that the pl plastic nibbles that hold the loudspeaker will not break. And so he was showing it two, three times, and then after that the robot understood what to do. He was searching for one of the loudspeakers and pressing it into the door. And this took minutes. So from the moment he wanted to l um, learn the task to the robot until it really it performed, it was minutes. And remember what we talked about, how long it can take if you um, if you would do this in the normal process. Even here, there must be a, um, a certification about security. Um, nevertheless, it is really impressive how fast it can learn. When we wrote the, um, this kind of um, proposal for the center, we also wanted to say um, that over the seven years that the program will run, we will have millions of skills trained to a robot and, and the time we are writing it down. We were not really sure, can we really get this 1 million skills to the robot? And um, because you have to train a lot. And the question is, who can do that? So after some testing, um, also with Wandelbots and trying out um, what can be done, here you see a 14-year-old girl that is training artificial um, task to a robot. For example, stapling different colored boxes on top of each other and um, she's explaining that um, by just moving it. You see here the orange points, they're not so many sensors, but she, was, she learned very quickly. And she was joining us only for a week. And in this week, um, she trained 1,000 skills to the, uh, to the robot. And the interesting part, it's not just a replay what you see here. It's, for example, in this case, stapled two black, um, two black um, cylinders over a white one. And whenever you put the first one on the uh, on the table, he will understand. I will put two on um, on top of that that are larger than the one that you take uh, put there. So it seems to work, and this was the very um, first step. Um, we are talking about three years ago. Now the question is, can we also do this training not only when we are in close proximity with the humans, or the expert, and the machine? Can we do this over longer distances? So imagine um, on the left side, we have now the well-equipped um, expert with a very cool um, closing, intelligent closing with a lot of sensors. How many we will need, doesn't, we will talk about this later. And every movement of the expert has to be conveyed to the machine, wh wherever it is. And in order to perform that, there must be a feedback to the human, what happens on the other side with the robot. So we are staying here in Europe and the, um, and the uh, robot is staying in Japan, for example. Then the problem is to get this kind of feedback what the robot is experiencing there. Because the problem here is speed of light. We will talk about this later. And how can we get a signal fast enough back to have this immersed feeling that this is a real-time um, feeling for the expert? There are some experts that are trained for delay, for example, like F-40-15 um, uh, fighters, pilots, and they're trained for latency, they can deal with that. But in order to get anybody um, to train a robot with a skill set, without getting this extra notion of what delay will do to you, um, we have to 
come up with different ideas. So what we will do is the human has a skill and every movement by the sensors, what also the young girl has had there, we are just transporting it over to the uh, robot. And then it can move um, and learn if you repeat this multiple times, but we need the feedback. We call it multimodal feedback, um, which is then, um, in this case, you see different um, feedbacks. And this, for example, is audio, video. We would know that, like virtual reality, augmented reality has this already. But what we also want here is to have a haptic feedback. So you want to, we, we found this out uh, when we had this robot that you saw before. Um, if you sit there with the jacket and the glasses and you just ask the robot to grab a cup of coffee, it's very, it was very difficult to find the right point when to close the hand. And if you do next time, if you grab a, a cup of coffee or a tea, you will see that your hand knows already when to grab. Maybe he touched it and knew, oh, I'm already there, or it feels the heat. You know exactly when to grab the, the cup. So. And um, we want to add also this experience and bundle it into the multimodal feedback. As I said before, in order to get this feedback right, we need to talk about which kind of characteristics have these feedbacks. And these feedbacks will differ in the need of data rate, bandwidth, so how many bits we have to um, bring over there. If you think about video, um, we know that's really big data, audio way less. And what is about haptic, right? Is this, if you have thousands of sensors, is it a lot of data? And besides the pure um, bandwidth, what is about latency? And here, and I said it before, it's not just a game for electrical engineering and computer scientists. Um, we are talking to um, psychology people, um, which are um, now giving us some numbers for the delay. How sens sensible are we when it comes to different uh, feedbacks. So visually uh, or audi auditive or tactile. And you see that there's a distribution. Some of us are more sensitive than others. For example, with sound, if you're a mu musician, you we know that you are se very sensible and um, the delay between things you are doing and what you hear should not be more than three milliseconds. This we already got um, good feedback from companies like Sennheiser who do headsets. They knew about this latency issue. And um, some of us are less um, sensitive. It could be five milliseconds and 10 milliseconds whatsoever. You see the green line here. And visual feedback, you might say maybe that can be very um, big. It depends a little bit where it happens. Is it in your front eye or on the side? And there the sensibility is uh, starting with 15 milliseconds. Now, if you go to the tactile, you see that we have something between one and three. It's not so big. So some people are very sensitive. They want to have one millisecond. And others, maybe you can satisfy it with three milliseconds. And it's all about giving a feedback to the expert that feels like real time. So for us, doing um, communication networks, it's very interesting to understand there are different traffic sources with different needs. How can we satisfy them? And if you talk about this low latency, what is, um, what is the human then really perceiving? Here you see one example where the human should just catch the ball. And it's not that the, the humans are stupid in this picture. They have a camera on the Samsung gear there where we use the camera to delay reality by some milliseconds. And these kind of milliseconds is LTE latency and we doubled it because we have to go back and forward. And just to prove that current cellular communication systems are not good enough to interact in virtual and augmented realities. So coming back, you will also understand if the expert and the machine are not on the, uh, at the same site, if there's distance between it, latency becomes an issue because you have to deal with speed of light. As I said before, Europe and Japan, 9,000 kilometers, and a speed of light will tell you it can do 300 kilometers in a millisecond. If we are now talking about fiber, there's a relative factor of um, 
60, 66%. Now there are some um, very good um, improvements that you can go up to 90% maybe. But even if we get full speed of light, we would have th uh, 30 milliseconds towards Japan and 30 milliseconds back. So the question is, how can we then train the robot from Europe to Japan? Do we have to take the expert and fly him over, right? Or is there another way to do it? And there's a trick um, how we can do it. And the, the first thing is, if you look at the, at the whole idea of latency, you, you would have a latency budget. Where can we spend it? And there are, for me, mainly three parts, right? One is the, um, the sensor actuator pair with the embedded computing, which will be mass market stuff that currently we are suffering from that because they're not um, really made for low latency. And as they will not cost so much money, the embedded computing will not be so fast. And if you want now to have the one millisecond, how much can you spend on this? Maybe 10%, right? 10% sensor, 10% actuator. And, and then on the wireless link, um, you will find out that you also can only spend 10% 10 millise uh, 10 of your millisecond. So if you look at the uh, 3G um, speed test currently with the latency, you will see it's not there yet. Right? We are talking about release 15, but I'm coming back to that. There are some improvements possible for that. But if you would allow 40% of the millisecond in this part of the game, that may means that in the backyard, you would only have 60% of the millisecond. So then you would need to understand that at least you could um, have find some kilometers of fiber in front of you let's say 25 kilometers max. And after that, we expect to have a full cloud solution. And as we don't um, have cloud data centers all over the places with this density, in the future, there will be some computing in the network. We talk about this later. And in this cloud computing, what we can perform is we can create models. Instead of teaching the real robot in Japan, we just ask in Japan, what kind of robot do you have? Right, so now um, what you can do is you build a model of the um, of the robot and just virtually bring it closer, very close to the um, expert who can then virtually train it. Think about an augmented uh, reality with like your the office space. You put off augmented reality and then just see what the robot will do, and then you teach him over there. Once it's learned, you can send it back. That's easy if it's only one robot. Imagine that you have in Japan three robots that are trained by three different experts around the world and they interact with each other. So now it's not so easy to take the model of the robot towards you. You have to bring the human to the other side, which is even more complicated because you have specification for a robot, but you don't have specification for a human. They're all different. Not so much, but psychology people will help us to tell what how this could be. So these are the safety challenges on a high level. Later, I come back to the detailed things um, and come back to the challenges. Now, it's not only that the human can train the, um, the robot, also the cloud or the robots can train uh, humans. So if you are a human and you would like to be trained, then um, it's not that the robot takes you by the hand and shows you what to do. Maybe the robot will be embedded into your closing again. So far, the closing um, consists only uh, out of sensors. Now we put actuators into that. And you can think about an exoskeleton, but that's clumsy, it's big. We think about closing that can really um, move itself, right? Which we currently already can do. The problem is that um, the speed is not as good as we would like to have it. But um, we still have um, five years time to do some research on that. Why is it so important to have this kind of um, closing that can really move? Um, it's about showing what you're doing, right? And supporting you in doing what you can do. So imagine um, you're an elderly person with dislocated shoulder. And what you should do is you should do an exercise every eight to ten times in a day. And the doctor will not be there always for you, right? Um, if you're in a hospital, fine. If you're at home, you would drive there maybe once a day. You would sit there uh, waiting for him an hour. Then he will come. And in 20 minutes, you do some exercises. Then you go back. But you did it once. And in order to do it um, 
even more and not just in a repetitive way that you always have new tasks. Um, imagine about the situation, the doctor is just calling you via video conferencing. You take on the jacket, the doctor puts on a jacket and the doctor will make a, a certain movement which your jacket will show you what to do until maybe it hurts or you say it's enough. And then the doctor will say, that's now your task. And with the jacket, you can really do the task for longer time. And the doctor will not even be present for the time and makes his life more efficient, right? It's nice for uh, the medical care. Then we have different um, use cases where we already um, supported, for example, in rowing. Here you see the backpack because we need something that is um, faster in pulling and supporting more. You can have something like a belt for climbing, not only to show you how to do it, but also hindering you to make the task a little bit more challenging. Um, we have also something for dancing. Um, I will maybe show you some pictures later on um, where um, a, a, a dancer that can dance but does not know the choreography can just come and with the help of the sensors knows more or less where to go. He has to know a little bit what to do, but the, the closing will help him. And this teaching experience is way better and the success rate is way faster than whether the, everybody around you has to show you what to do and what not to do. So there are real projects currently ongoing in the area of sports where we try this out. The end game, so to say, for us is where humans and machine in this cohabitation case can really do something together. Multiple people training machines, machines training each other. That's also very interesting because um, imagine that you would have one robot in a given context and he would like to train this skill to another robot in a different context. Maybe the robots are even different, right? So the challenge here is really um, not just to exchange the, the code. It would be interesting whether they can train the other side what to do. And currently we have some um, good ideas how this works and also some nice results. Um, interesting is also the point when the machine that would like to train the other machine understands that there's not enough information to train to complete the training and humans should be called to do some fine tuning on the other side okay so um, you will see these kind of three um, examples human teach machine machine teach humans or all of them work together throughout my talk when we have um, oh, one example here for example here is um, a nice demonstration uh, again with Wandelbots. Wandelbots is um, here um, close to the campus in Dresden and what they did is a training from an outside city in Seattle and you know it's, it, these are also around 9,000 kilometer distance and this is Satya the CEO of Microsoft who's really performing a training um, from his headquarter um, to a robot that stands in, um, in Dresden. So there is already a way of creating these models and overcoming the problem of, a, of the training. And also, I think he said it, he was satisfied, so there must be something in it. If we could now bring this idea to the full extent, um, there will be a lot of research questions. I'll come back to that in a minute. But you can also think about how this will change um, the way we do business or how the society will interact in the future. So from the business side, um, what we can do now is really we can reprogram um, robots very fast and if you imagine that robots will become very cheap that it doesn't mean that we send things to Asia where we say this t-shirt one million times but we could say okay we have requests for 10 t-shirts with a certain size and we tra train the robot how to do it and then we will come and this is the idea of digitalization and industry 4.0 to achieve this lot size of one instead of making copies of copies, what we would like to do is individualize products. And this is something that you could do with such an approach. The reprogramming is not so costly anymore as it was before. So the way we have business will change. The other thing is how society will learn, how they interact, how old you can get until, uh, or how long can you stay in your own home with assistance, uh, robots and whatsoever, or clothing that can assist you, right? For example, um, if it has forces, can it help you to stand up? Can it um, help you in doing certain things, supporting the skill sets you had already? So these are the things that I would like to discuss in the future. 
uh, in the slides. But um, I separated my talk in three different parts, and this is the end of the first part. So maybe are there any questions um, so far for um, for the first part? Otherwise, I would continue with the part B. Any questions? Okay, so let me continue and go a little bit more into detail. So far, everything was high level. And um, I would like to start with, again, with the challenges, right? And um, the challenges, I described them in, um, already a little bit, but let's go more in detail. Where, we, where do we see the problem? So, for example, if you look at the, the, the latency, it's not only the propagation latency that you have, there's also latency in computing, there's latency in the system hardware, there's um, latency uh, in the network part. So let's have a look into this, what happens. We talked about one millisecond, three milliseconds. And now if you would take a normal camera, right, with um, 30 hertz and um, there's some hardware behind it, then you would have every 30 milliseconds a picture, five milliseconds delay by the hardware. Right? Then you have an encoding, a coding buffer, local network, which means very um, small latency added to that, and decoding part. And then you have the display part. Right? And if you look at the what we call glass-to-glass -glass delay, and um, our colleague Eckhard Steinbach did a great job and a lot of papers on that, measuring the latency, then you would say something around 60 milliseconds if you take commercial off-the-shelf stuff, um, what we have today. If you then don't have a local network, if you would have a wide area network that will give you maybe another 100 millisecond on it, then we are talking not about 60 milliseconds, about 160 milliseconds, right? So that is not really um, good. And we have to go now box by box to see well, how can we decrease the latency here, right? And um, the big part here is the, the network part. There can be done something, but also the current hardware not good as it is. Um, there are some um, real results from Eckhart um, where he just said what is the glass-to-glass -glass delay for Skype, FaceTime, Hangouts, Jitsi Meet, right? And in these times of Corona, everybody knows this. The latency is really annoying when you have a con communication and uh, uh, you always fall into the word of the others. And then you go, no, you go. And that, that's the delay problem, right? And if you see that, that's something around 200 milliseconds that we face currently. Now, if you want to fly a drone, right, there are some digital drone or analog drones, and the analog drones are way better, right? There you can go around 30 milliseconds already. But analog has a problem because um, it's point to point, right? You cannot just um, prolong it um, for wide area networks. Now, um, if you look at smartphones, they are goddamn slow and they are made slow by uh, the uh, manufacturers like Apple and Google. Um, they have some huge delay if you use the multimedia chain that they have embedded. Samsung has some tricks how you get the camera output directly to the screen, but you have to know these things, right? Um, if you, Otherwise, you would end up at hundreds of milliseconds easily. So the best, what Eckhart showed with his group was really to say, okay, if we do everything, the best, 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 what we currently have, we are around 50 milliseconds, which is already impressive. It's low, but um, we have to bring it down even more, right? If we really want to have a real uh, time experience for the expert. Um, so this plot I showed you before, these are um, now the um, sensitive, um, sensitivity for tactile um, auditory and visual and what you also see on the on the left on the y-axis is fraction of rats above chance so currently we are doing it really with humans um, the psychology people tell us rats or humans that will not change so much on the um, on the numbers over here and I told you already there are some matching numbers for audio and video that we already have for tactile we are currently doing it um, my colleague Shushan Li is um, have an own lab just for um, repeating this um, measurements for for humans. 
So um, there a different neutral time for a multisensory perception. This is something what we would like to do. Interesting is also that this feedback, the sensitivity to feedback, um, depends how old you are. So if we want to do something with humans, we always have to understand on the other side who is sitting there. So this plot shows you a little bit over age that um, the best performance in, in terms of delay you have uh, between 20 and 30, and then it's degrading all over the time. First you learn, you learn the curve is steep, and then you degrading slowly with the ages. Now, that's, by the way, the reason when you play with your students FIFA, you always lose. Um, so there's an explanation for that, right? They should be punished with an... Um, additional delay on the controller when they play against their old professor. Um, this is very important. So again, psychology people are doing this for us. They look how, if you're tired, for example, the tiredness of the body is important on the delay behavior. Then the age is important, etc. There are many um, factors that have an impact on the latency. Now, um, as I said, on the age, um, these are currently also some results how um, um, how different people of different elves, like children or older adults, younger adults, behave on the activity in the brain and um, whether we can take something um, out there, what we can improve over there. Also some related work down here, as you can see that. Okay, so what we have figured out is from the human body, we have to understand, first of all, the degrees of freedom, right? The medical people there will, under, will help us and... Um, will understand what kind of movement is possible. It's, it's like a model, so to speak. But then you have some delay receptors that are coming from the psychology people telling you something about the senses and what their requirements are. So one of the objectives um, that we have here is human perception and action. So this is one big part. You will see it later on. Another one is the system-related um, latency. So the challenge currently, if you buy something, often it's too big, too much energy, too slow, too stiff. And um, which means we are now doing our own closing, right? So um, from, this, from the ground on, that's um, not so complicated. But for example, we are already putting in our own electronics, our own connectors, flexible electronics, flexible connectors, in order to make them um, not so stiff and you need electronics that are fast, not consuming so much energy. So um, they will be integrated in what we call the e-glove and the e-jacket. And um, we have also here what you see by Fraunhofer, a partner from Fraunhofer, some display that you just hang in front of your eye. It's like a display and that is um, very fast. And it helps, for example, for augmented and virtual reality. Um, currently, we, we say we at least 10... 10 times faster, maybe we can even do more. And um, this has to be connected also to something computing in um, on your body. We call it body hub, where there's a little bit some computing that you don't do it directly on the screen, but you will not take your sensor data, send it to the cloud in the US and get back. That will destroy your, um, your latency again. Now, um, the body computer also needs a 300 megahertz professor, uh, processor at least. And um, we want to have wireless tran um, transceivers that are ultra compact, bendable, stretchable, so that we can invade them into our uh, e-jacket in the e-glove. Um, the other thing is also, um, oh, sorry, um, just to, to name then the um, Objective also here, I think it's not named here on the slide, but it's of course to make um, better electronics, right? Sensor and actuators. Now, the um, other thing is about human machine mutual learning, how machines will learn. Machine learning is um, one part of the story, but how will also humans learn? If you want to train them, should we do it the same way we train people today? Or is there a better way when we have this new form of um, jackets that can move or trousers that can move? Is there something where the learning curve could be better um, understanding that we have new means here? So human machine learning is one of the objectives as well. Then we have um, the human machine networks, communication networks on computing. So I told you that already 
computing is important for us. It should not be in the end devices, so for the cloud or the um, wireless receivers. It should be in the network because in the network means we don't have to, uh, we can save the energy on the um, sensor actuators on the body or on the machine, but we are not so far away that we increase the latency too much. So we have to understand this transformation from cloud and pipes to smart infrastructures. And um, we have to understand the mobility, the placement of intelligence in a network. My part C will talk about this more or less. And then there's something very interesting. I will come back to this in part C, as I said, that we have um, a mapping of the sensors to virtual channels, right? So um, we have video signal, audio signal, haptic um, signal. And if you would mix this in one network, they will all get the same delay mix, but this is not what you really need. Some of them need high data rate, others need low latency, lower latency than others. And this is not in line with the net neutrality, so we have to form something. We need different networks. And if you want to have physically different networks, this is not very efficient, right? And therefore, there's a new way of creating logical networks within a network, which is called network slicing. Um, we come back to this later. There's also some issues about privacy, security that we have to, to think about and um, the placement of this in the network. There's something called Mobile Edge Cloud. Um, I'm going back to that. And when we call it, when we talk about networks, the question is what kinds of networks, right? We have body area networks, local area networks, wide area networks. In wide area networks, it's, just, it's more the propagation delay that has um, an impact. On the body area network, the latency um, is more coming from the sensors. How good are they? How many are there, right? If you talk about just the sensor, there's some systematic um, delay on that. But when they want to send their information to, for example, a body hop like there, um, the transmission will take time. Not so much, I would guess, because the packets are small, data rate can be high, but as we have a lot of, of these sensors, it can come back to the time, how long will you take to get access to the channel to actually send out the information. And in local area networks, where uh, there's a mix of body area networks and machines talking to each other, it's very interesting to understand that they, there we have already a little bit of propagation delay, but also propagation delay from the data rate and the transmission del um, delay and also the, the systematic, um, so the system um, latency. And this means we do solutions for different type of, of networks here. We also have, um, in order to get this wide area network, we have one big um, nationwide um, test pad from Dresden to Munich, where we can really test out training sequences between Dresden and Munich, which is more or less 500 kilometer. Um, as you can see here, using the fibers that are in the ground here. Um, this is made really for humans training a machine or machines training other machines. And um, that is um, very interesting because it's a full-blown SDN and FV test bed and we can use it later. So the objective here is to create human machine networks and human machine computation. Um, then there is, um, we, we originally we called it the C, um, the triple C um, room because there's com communication, coding, compression. You can even add control, right? And the question is, would we take the standard way of communication as it is now, or do we find new means to improve the situation to get information out of, for example, send multiple massive number of sensors uh, into the cloud? And you have always this kind of trade-off between throughput, resilience, and delay in a network. And the question is, how can you break it up? Normally, you can optimize for one at the expense of, um, of uh, another one. So um, this is quite interesting. Um, we have some, um, some pre-work for this. Um, haptic communication over 5G tactile internet is um, a work by Michel Dola. And we did our own um, um, work already there um, that you can find on the internet. And the question is, for example, I give you some examples. How can I get data out of massive amount of um, 
of sensors. Later, if we uh, the time allow, I will show you that. But um, what you can see here that for certain um, large number of sensors, we can bring down the traffic load for the certain sparsity, which means how correlated are the sensor information on your body um, down to 10%. And how to do this, we will show you. Another one is how can we break up the classical trade-off between throughput and latency. Um, here you see, for example, two points, stop and wait and selective repeat. Or if you have a communication and you, you face errors, you need a forward error correction or automatic request um, protocol. And you either have low data rate, right? and low latency for stop and wait, or with selective repeat, you have high throughput, but also higher delays. And what we do with a new kind of coding, I will tell you a little bit this, we have a very versatile code that allows you to have very a lot of operation points. The trade-off is still there, but it's, it looks better than the, um, the points that are off, um, currently offered. And we try to get up to the left um, higher corner but what you can see here already, you can get low latency, lower latency than stop and wait. And um, you can do something also for, for throughput, uh, reducing the latency over there. And if you now think about, I have haptic, audio and video, maybe these are three different operation points, right? So maybe this point with the 90% here, you would give for the video, um, this one for audio and the other one, uh, this one for the haptic. One, one example. Another one is, for example, when you don't use this uh, RQ protocols, if you use some kind of block code, what you always do is you transport uh, information, you are coding them, and because you code them, you always have to wait for some block phases until you can really decode the information. And this is the classical trade-off. You, you get uh, resilience, but you pay with latency, right? So this is the transmission from Lena, a little bit delayed, and, but maybe you can do it faster, right? So this is another code, and uh, you see that um, with the incoming packets, the same amount of packets that you had seen on the left side, but the, picket, the picture gets better and better and better. Now, the question is, what kind of picture do you need, right? Can you make some, some assumptions, some decisions even earlier when you have um, a blurry picture? Is this maybe enough? because you do, it's not like your vacation pictures that you would like to store. This is more about um, making a decision whether the robot should go left and right when he sees the humans. Right? So new questions in information theory that we have to deal with. Um, which brings us to the objective, what we call human-machine communication. So if you bring everything together, right, you have here the human, right? you have the machine, and then you say, okay, some people should work on the human perception. We call it the, the talent pool one, right? We group researchers and say, you do that. Then we have a talent pool two, where we build the sensor and, um, the sensor and actuators for the human machine co-augmentation. TP4, a group that deal with flexible electronics. Um, then this information theory that I just explained um, has another, it's another group over here. And then we have some people from another talent pool, number five, which is the human machine networks, which have to deal with computing, security, and privacy. So there are other things like human machine learning and um, human machine computation that will be done in these talent pools in the group of researchers. And it's a way of grouping now researchers into the different objectives. And when you do that, you see here our building, we call it um, our city virtual, our virtual rooms. And down in the bottom, you, you see, once again, you see the, the talent pools, right? Talent pool one until talent pool five. What we really want to achieve is on the top, right? On the highest floor, you see the use cases, the medicine, the industry, the internet of skills that are introduced to you in the uh, in the beginning of my talk. And now the question is, can the talent pools directly feed into the use cases? Not so much. There's intermediate layers. There's one floor, what we call the key technology. There's the enablers for us. And we have to deal with some new questions. For example, as I told you, we have codecs for audio and video, but we don't have codecs for haptic, right? And so in order to build a good haptic code, you have to understand what, for what I'm doing this. So for example, in audio, an MPEG-3 was so successful because it knew for what it will compress for the human ear. So there's a lot of things it was just thrown out. 
And in order to understand what you can throw out, what is redundancy, you have to talk to the TP1, to people that tell you, hey, here is something um, about the human body. And TP3, for example, will bring you new approaches and combining now the talent pool, the talents in TP1 and TP3 can go up to um, K1 and create the new room haptic codes. And this is not a new form of researcher that is sitting there. This is a, a mixture of people from the different talent pools. So what we are doing now is the higher you go on the floor, you're mixing the, re the researchers and um, you're getting some synergy, some interdisciplinary research done in the K rooms, which will be even more if you go to the um, U rooms. Next to the K1 room with haptic codes, we have 1K, K2 for the intelligent networks that will take um, impact from TP3 and TP5 for sure, but also from TP2 and TP4 to understand what kind of sensors are there, um, how to bring them together, what are the latency requirements and the latency characteristics of these sensors and actuators, bringing this together. In K3, we have augmented um, PI and K4 is co-adaptation, the learning part, humans and machine, also talking to different talent pools. And the higher layers just send requirements to the lower layers, while the lower layers always enabling the higher rooms. That is the idea. And this is, was more or less the starting point. Now you can imagine that we can add more rooms on certain floors, we can remodel the, the rooms, and um, just to tell you uh, what we are doing inside them, for example, if you look at the U-rooms, and I told you already we're looking at medicine, industry, internet of skills, then the question will be different for the K-rooms and the requirements, right? And um, for example, in the medical part, uh, how can we model the skills, right? So capture data from skilled behavior via multimodal sensors. So we have to equip a, a whole operation room with sensors. That is actually done here in Dresden. Uh, Stephanie Speidel is leading this and she's also developing operational stochastic models and where you really can um, train um, young st um, students that would like to become medical doctors. And um, what you can do is you create models by, from the experts that have done the job and just train the young people with that. So um, without going um, into the next level is also the question, how can we train the skills, right? And um, for example, my idea is always, I would like to learn the piano. Can a glove help me, a jacket, how to do that? How should I sit? Maybe it could also play for me eight fingers and I just take care of the first two fingers. And then I learn by adding more and more fingers to my own re responsibility. Um, good, then as I said, from the U cases, then you can go to the K rooms where you say, oh, I have the haptic codec. So this is about data reduction, right? If you just would let 1000 um, sensors go on the wireless um, access, then you would destroy the delay. Even if you would have um, only 1% of a millisecond by transmitting, if you have 1000 of them, um, then you're back and you're destroying the latency. So there must be a clever way reading them out. And one way is not to read them all out, but still get a good notion of all of the 1,000. Okay, then there's um, TP2 adds some multimodal variables with ultra low latency sensing at the very high precision. Everything this is needed now to support the U1 room, right? You had uh, the K1 for the haptic codes, and now you have TP2. And by that, you, are, you see how the room's adding up to each other. Um, the same is when you look from the U1 perspective, um, you need the um, K4 room for um, models that capture the intention and actions that define the surgical task. So, which means the intention is maybe you don't measure it, you know it before it really happens, right? This would give you some negative delay that you can later consume in other um, elements. And then you would ask maybe K4 would then ask TP1 about models of goal-directed multisensory perception, right? And then you would have such a um, dependency on the rooms. But then not the only one, there could be also TP5, right? So multiple TP rooms feeding it and this, uh, for example, the security and privacy stuff is also important. And the idea this behind our research is um, coming from something we call the iterative research program, theory that matters, 
which means that we have fundamental research that's actually is carried out in the TP rooms. These are the expert knowing that, but also in the K rooms, this can happen. So you think about theories, concept, mathematical analysis, models. And what you then try to do is you test it out. You test it out in the use cases. And you can do it simulation, software in the loop, hardware in the loop, which will be done by the TP and K rooms alone. But when you really want to test out in the rooms, then you have human in the loop. And with this optimization loops, you can always improve your simulation, always improve software in the loop, hardware in the loop, until you come to the point where you find out it's not good enough. And this is the point where the inner loop in optimization in the lower part of this model is not good enough. You have to go back to the fundamental research. You have to back to the whiteboard, understanding maybe there's a new math that you have to develop to get the latency down. And then you test out the theory again by bringing it down to the different loops. With that, we think that the exploitation paths in publication patterns, standardization, but also building our own startups, right, um, can be improved and we will test it here. Just some numbers here, as I told you, that's not only electrical engineering, computer science, even from 25 PIs that we initially had to name, 14 of them came from there, but we have people from psychology, medicine, but also from um, other um, disciplines, right? We had five disciplines there, um, then you, different nations, and um, these PIs created already um, 57 startups, which I think there's the, the idea. What you also see here is some pictures from the first meetings where we had some bullets with the lines and by these lines, maybe you can understand why we did it. We needed the dependency of the rooms, but also we created the pyramid that you saw before. The three floors is a result of this maybe more chaotic pin in points at the, what you see here. Important is then the cooperation, how we spin cooperation in the interdisciplinary research. We believe that the topic itself is already doing the job. And we have, of course, cooperation on campus, but also external partners like MIT, Mori Melda is there working on the information theory part. Um, Arizona State University, Martin Reisland helps us, for example, uh, with um, traces for, um, for the um, learning part. Um, Industry, as I said, this wide area network that we are using is coming from the Deutsche Telekom. We have with the King's College, which has also a big team working on tactile internet, um, a trans campus, which is a program where two campuses are put together, which now in the time of Brexit is even more important, and um, where we also will do something on our tactile internet topic. Good. And as the topic itself is so interdisciplinary, what we also envisioned is um, to have such a truck. It's a lab on, on wheels, as we said, and we would like to visit schools with that. Why is this important? We would like to get impact on the next generation of researchers, and we have to get them when they're very young. Because here in Germany, they have to decide in a certain age whether they go towards STEM or not. And this is something to tell the people, it's not only math, it's not only computer science. You have to know something about humans. You have to improve the life of humans, which will also maybe bring in more female researchers for our topic. And this is the picture from the, um, from the uh, project uh, proposal that we delivered. And here are some first results from last year. Here you see the truck. It was a big truck that we po um, put outside um, in Dresden, and we also used it for the long night of science, where um, from six o'clock in the evening until midnight, um, 2,500 people visited us and wanted to know something about this new type of research. And um, you can see people coming in, you to talk to them, and they learn about the uh, international researchers, the training of the uh, stackable um, cylinders. You see here again, they could try it out. But as I said, main objective was to bring in school classes. And here you see young kids that uh, first learn about uh, some minor set of slides, not as many as you have seen here today, but then they can really test something out, right? They can train a robot, they can even um, uh, remote control a, a robot to make a selfie for them that then they will be printed or sent out, which was a big thing for the kids. And we also presented our first version of the of a glove here. And as you can see, the computing is still on top. It still requires too much energy because you need the cable. But you already see that there are some sensors embedded in the glove, which are flexible, right? And with that, we already started it. 
the current version looks a little better and uh, it's more functional. And we hope to show it maybe in one of the next tutorials um, for ICC or Globcom. Then the teaching part um, is also not only by driving there for one day, we have one partner school where we can develop a curriculum where we really um, have an impact on the curriculum. They have some robots now that can only train them and interact with them. And we, we are really looking forward how they really interact with us on this topic. Good, then um, I, th I hope that you understand the CT challenges a little bit. I have a last part. I have to watch at the clock. I am more or less done. Um, nevertheless, I would glance through it because um, there will be a time when we can upload the slides um, either here on ICC or I can do it on my web page if you want to do that. Um, I don't see any question and as I'm a little bit under time constraints, I will just um, hop to the next topic. And the next topic is now going into this more K2 TP3 related world, right? So how can we really help to reduce the latency in the communication link, right? Um, as I said, room-wise K2 TP3 uh, TP5, that's the topic. And for all of you that are interested, um, together with uh, our colleagues Granelli and Zeling, we wrote a book on this, Computing and Communication Network. It's a hands-on book where you can test out um, your own skills, can program something, and what I tell you to, today in a nutshell, you can really test it out later. So um, there are some links here um, that are related to the book or to um, some, a new topic called network coding or um, some of the other things where you really can see YouTube videos, how to do and uh, interact with us over um, an own software that we have created. Um, the challenge now is, because of the short time, just to tell you, if we want to create a network for the tactile internet, um, what is out there, what can, can be used? And the good news is there is already something out. And here I'm talking about more about 5G. 1G to 4G was about consumer-oriented communication, right? Where 5G does communication for things in control. Not the currently least 15, but with really 16 towards 17, 18, um, hopefully we get better and better latency things. So 5G has really the, the task of um, supporting Industry 4.0, making cars uh, remotely driving, etc. pp. What is also different to the other generations is there's a um, counter activity on the wired world. They also sometimes refer to 5G because they use the same topics. And there's two standardization bodies, 5G and the ITF, who will, um, who will contribute there. And they're now even talking to each other, even though they're two different worlds. And in the old world, they just um, stick together a cable and said, now we are connected. What they are doing now is to understanding each other, what they are doing in order um, to deal with, um, with this latency issue. You, you cannot do it only on one side, right? And interesting is um, how the two different agencies deal with uh, innovation. So in our cellular world, we always have innovation every 10 years, right? So 10 years ago, we introduced 4G, then 10 years before that, 3G, and so on. The ITF part, there's more or less a daily update, right? They meet only three times a year, but they discuss things, they um, work on the drafts, and they, they can just do the changes right away. They don't have to wait 10 years. And the reason for that is the left part is more or less hardware-driven, while the other one was software-driven. But with 5G, this will change. Therefore, also the topic of computation in networks, right? Software will take a bigger chunk. There will be big research on hardware for better antennas, better RF baseband's, um, better computing, accelerated computing, energy efficient computing. That is the hardware part. But software will be everything that is related to the service where you quickly can change something and adapt to something. So, which means computing is now inside the network. It's not anymore on the outside. Good. Um, Just to tell you what we mean by communication, in the older world, communication was just transport bits from A to B in a transparent way. So that was the doom of the network operators. They don't, didn't even know what they convey for bits. 
Now, when the computing comes into the network, you have communication is now not only the transport, but also storage and computing inside the network. And as you remember, maybe we need this to reduce the latency. What defines 5G? Um, you know maybe the fi famous triangle about high data rate, massive IoT, massive low latency. This is what the um, ITU and the IMT 2020 standard um, did. And they also tell you um, what it is needed. Interesting is that 4G already can do some of the parts, right? It can help you for high data rates. It's improving over time. And um, you will also see um, narrowband IoT, which can do a small number of, uh, of sensors. But the low latency, this is something that is only given to 5G, right? You will, due to the protocol design of 4G, it will be pretty hard to change that. And this is really the unique selling point for um, 5G. And then you have to deal with the latency for humans and machines. These are the two things that we have to deal with. And 5G was mainly only looking at the machines. What we are doing in the tactile internet is to combine humans and machines into this world. Now, our definition of 5G looks a little bit different. It's not a triangle. We say it's an atom. And there are other videos where you can learn a little bit about the, this atom, where we say we have a, every atom has a core, which are the use cases there. And um, I will name some of them. It's Industry 4.0, connected driving, energy grids, learning, construction, agriculture, you name it. And all of them will come up and say, ah, we have different requirements in terms of latency, throughput, massiveness, resilience, security, energy, or heterogeneity. And this is interesting because um, they have different requests for them, but more or less they need all of them at the same time. So if you just look at latency and you would say one millisecond, is this a problem? Yeah, um, latency was a problem. Gamers knew that. Therefore, they were always gathering in one hall playing there because data rate is not an issue. Latency is not an issue. So if you, you know, gather everything in one hall, proximity is the solution, right? So next is, I showed you this latency plot already. Remember that? Um, we have to de deal with that and see how we can manage it, but maybe it's not a big thing, right? Here's a video from Eckhart Steinbach sh showing you the impact on latency on, on machines. I showed you something on humans. And what you see here is a tactile joystick, and as long as you have five milliseconds delay, it works more or less okay, but with 10 milliseconds, you see already it becomes instable. And every cyber-physical system will have different situations, but we know this before that so we can adapt the network to the given task, right? It's harder for the humans, as I said. They, we have to know which of the multimodal feedback we are discussing, and we have to know how old they are, if they are tired, etc. pp. So if you look at latency um, for LTE, I told you already, um, you get something about 30 milliseconds if you are very lucky currently. Um, and if you take some Wi-Fi oriented approach, what you see is the situation looks better in the beginning if there are not so many um, nodes. But once you have around 10 um, devices, you're way higher than the LTE latency. So this is the problem with Wi-Fi technology. This listen before talk is not made for latency, right? Therefore, train is going to, towards 5G for us. Now, latency alone is not a problem. If you want latency and throughput at the same time, you have to... Uh, there we are coming back to the trade-off that I talked before. Here are some figures that we um, train our students with in the first year, um, calculating throughput for a Wi-Fi based system. Um, and it tells you make bigger packets to, to increase the throughput, but also bigger packets means higher latency, right? And if you then want re resilience at the same time, then we are back to our plot that I showed you before. Now, if you want to get these things together, like late latency, uh, throughput, and resilience, you need new approaches. So a new air interface, I think I motivated this more than enough. The architecture will be different. It's not just device to the base station. We will find more mesh type situations. We will exploit multi-pass. We have to think about content delivery networks where we place content already in a very nice way. Um, we know how to do that, so this is well known, but we can use it here. And there are the two things, network slicing and mobile edge cloud. I named already this as very important for the tactile internet. 
and I will come back to this to explain you what we mean by that. So um, multipath, um, I will not go through it too much. Um, you can see it later in the slides. Multipath is something very well known in the uh, in the discussion of communication networks. We we left the telephone lines. We went over to the um, to the internet just because of one reason, because we could use multipath to make a network resilient. Later we found out that we pay this resilience with throughput and it was never implemented. Currently multipath is coming back, multipath TCP and multipath UDP for um, low latency uh, but resilient communication. So um, in the 60s they calculated already, Paul Barron did this here, um, what the resilience will do when you use multipath. So we knew it, but we could not deploy it at that cost. And now with the new information theory, we can maybe bring down the cost, having the resilience and also the throughput that we want in the network. And that multipass is a good idea. Your brain is using multipass in times of danger. Ants are using this for food re uh, recovery. So quite interesting. Mesh type, um, I will not show you the video. and um, You can go to our web page to see that. And we have one company, one startup now, Meshmerize, that is building mesh type um, situations for cars or for drones. I would like to show you just this network slicing thing. What the idea is, you have a physical network that you can now slice logically in different networks with different characteristics. For example, one slice is um, dealing with smartphones, high data rate, pure high data rate. Another slide is doing autonomous driving. This is low latency, very important. There's not so much data rate needed, but low latency. And then you have for one slice for, um, for sensors, massive amount of sensors. So different networks mapped physically on the same phys physical network, but logical networks now, which you can even dimension uh, in different things. So it sounds spooky. Um, there's an, a demo that I brought you. Um, oops, where is... Ah, here it is. I have to click on it. Um, here you see um, the city of Barcelona uh, with a lot of traffic ongoing. The, um, the traffic is controlled by uh, 5G. And you see here two slices, one for the car and one slice for, for the people watching a video. Video quality is high. The cars are going with 50 kilometers, right? Because we have this one millisecond. And uh, what you see now is an accident, right? And because of the accident, humans are coming and what they do, more pictures, then they want to have more bandwidth. Currently, everything is still the same. 45 kilometers, one millisecond, a network delay for the cars, 30 milliseconds for the, um, for the humans. But now the police arrives, fireworkers arrive, and they also want communication, right? And they want to communicate with each other in this area. And they will make a third slide. So they will say, we need now one millisecond. And what you see is you, they are stealing it from the cars and from the, from the humans in this point because they need this low latency. They are bringing in drones to film the situation, to bring in flying base stations. And um, now you see with four milliseconds latency, the, the speed for the cars in this area is going down to 22 kilometers. And even the quality of the video is going down. We made it maybe too dramatic, but just to let you know what would happen. Later, um, if the police goes away, the slide will be destroyed and everything go back, goes back to normal, right? As you can see here. Now, the other thing is the, the computing part, right? This one, the slicing is good to deal with the trade-off. The slicing is good to understand that I can make one slice for haptic, one for audio, one for video. They have different requirements. And the Mobile Edge Cloud is needed for something like, where do I do the computing? So we know that we have normally um, one cloud somewhere in the US where you can say, um, control my robot, right? And you have a ver one cloud there with a very long stripe on this. Now, to make it more um, reliable, you could think about, uh, can we do multiple clouds? That's good for storage, as we have shown in some of our work. But for computing, that's not so easy. You cannot just replicate things. Like in Multipass, you replicate passes. In storage, you replicate cloud storage. But cloud computing, you cannot just replicate like this. So what we need is some agile distributed mobile edge cloud. They call it mobile edge. I'm not so sure it has really to be at the edge. It can be placed somewhere. So what happens here is um, one 
PowerPoint illustration, right? Wherever the robot is, we have to move the cloud as close as possible to reduce the latency, right? Now, as I said, it doesn't have to be at the edge. It could be also in different hierarchies because um, some of them are, the higher you go, the more latency you have, but you also have a better view on the situation. And maybe that is a combination of all of them. We have implemented that. There are some videos uh, on, the, um, on our YouTube channel um, for, for example, a game called Tron, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. I leave it up to you to really look at this. Um, what the impact is, now placing a game server in Frankfurt and Sao Paulo while the game is running was challenging. Not anymore. We have done that. Look up this stuff. And what it really does, this mobile edge cloud you see here, this is the city of um, Munich. There's a car going around. And in order to have low latency, you have the cloud at the, always at the base station. There's no comput computation, and we always place it here, right? Because we think the closer it is, the propagation delay would be minimal. But computation delay is not the only thing, right? There could be also computing delay. If you go to a base station where there's already a lot of things calculating, that's not a good choice. So the placement in a network, that is something very interesting. Okay, so now we say network slicing is great, mobile edge cloud is great, how can we do that? And there are some technologies upcoming, like um, software-defined networks, network function virtualization, that are similar to something where we have heard about software-defined radio, right? So it's software, software, software. And in a nutshell, SDN is a very um, centralized way, away from the distributed approach of the internet, centralized to say which um, route should be taken. You can optimize the, um, the network in a nutshell, and every millisecond you can reorganize it as you want, and you have a centralized controller, whether it's a physical single one or a logical one. I don't want to know this. And the NFV is what apps are for your mobile, for your, um, mobile phone. You just install apps. And then what happens is that um, you have new functions. And the network operator wants to have the same. And NFV is nothing else than installing apps in the network, loosely speaking, right? And um, I would now go through the um, whole definition of that. It's a little bit uh, too time consuming. I would just um, finalize. I hope I can do this. No, I cannot do it like this. Let me do it like this. And now. Ah, so. Um, I have to do it like this, sorry. There are more slides you can look it up. Um, we don't have the time now. So I just want to bring back and the interconnection of this 5G and the tactile internet, right? So coming back to our expert, nicely skilled person with a cool dress and teaching the robot. Now 5G, what um, we have to do there, uh, it can do something for us. And these are the atoms that you have seen before. So for example, um, in order to communicate, we need the kind of network slicing. In order to um, have the different audio, video, and haptic um, channels, we create them by network slicing. <laughs> to create a model like a robot or the human, we will place this model in a mobile edge cloud, very close to the robot or to the human, whatever we need. We need new air interfaces that can deal with a massive amount of sensors. We need machine learning type as for the use case, <laughs> but also for the optimization of the networks. So here you see the, the electrons of our 5G atom bringing back to the tactile internet. Last but not least, um, the question is where we go. And most people will say, ah, we have to go to 6G. Um, I'm not so um, um, interested in the term 6G. I know that there is a future. And the future, whatever it is, right? I would not label it 6G. Um, me and Gerhard have always have a dispute about should it be 6G or XG or whatever. Um, but what is for sure is that 5G targeted something like machines, like cars and um, and drones, because you, these are things that will um, you need a 5G network for that on a national wide network. But human machine cohabitation does not need this kind of mobility. It is very focused on, a, for example, in Industry 4.0 for the hall. If you want to, if you have a bakery, for example, you just need it in your bakery. You don't need, you don't have mobility, right? So the, the interesting part is that this tactile internet can be done in the 5G context, but even for the future, 
And this is maybe not about new functionality, it's more about cost, energy, and whatsoever. And we can deliver these kind um, of network out of a box, right? What I mean by out of box is something what we call here in Germany 5G campus networks. Um, here we have a container that is something that we have here in the backyard where we have a fully equipped 5G network. The coverage is as far as our antenna can look. And inside the mobile edge cloud, the network slicing happens in the box and the services are in the box. You cannot connect outside, but for example, in order to train robots in a hall and in an industry, that would be the future. And with that, I would leave you to, the, uh, to our next speaker, Gerhard, who will tell you more about these test fields that we have and that could then tell you exactly for different use cases what is happening there. But there's an interesting um, way we look at the technology now and everything we do for 5G, everything we do in ITF under the name SDN NFV is really going towards us in the, um, in the um, tactile internet. And we have to find now use cases that are important for the people out there that we, they can use the tactile internet even for very small companies. But Gerhard will tell you more with that. I would end my talk here and um, would just stay here for, um, for some questions, if there are any questions. You can put them on the Slack. And um, Oh, I see a question. Wait a minute. Hello, maybe you are going to mention later, but where you locate the time-sensitive networking in the picture? Man, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> there is a, a 5G atom with a TSN in that. And if you look in the book, we talk about TSN because we think it's a very important factor. We have also some videos about using TSN, how to optimize it, how to get the latency down there. Um, the 5G atom, as I showed it today, is not complete. You can add more electrons there, right? I would say not so much on the lower end, but on the innovation part. There, there's way more space for you to do something. And also for the concepts like TSN can be added there. Are there any um, other questions? Okay, here's another question. For the mobile edge cloud to integrate with 5G core, what could we consider and what intelligence we can add? I think that the mobile edge cloud itself is already the intelligence, right? It, whatever you put in there, that is um, your intelligent, yeah. Ah, com computing. Okay, for me, the mobile edge cloud, this is often the, the computing. It's not so much the, the storage part. And um, they call it cloud, but I think we should talk about computing when we see MEC. It's not cloud, it's not edge. It should be agile computing, right? Because you want maybe to distribute it and all the things. So the intelligence is uh, one part. So this will be your program, for example, steering a car. Um, or as I said, if you have a model of a, of a robot that has to be teached. The thing is now, how can you make it resilient, right? If you move it around, what happens if you move it somewhere and the, it dies over there, right? How In storage and in, in communication, we said multi-pass or multi-cloud is the solution, diversity. Diversity in computing is not so easy. There are some works on this already um, already now, but compared to the other diversity topics, not so much. Okay, I don't see any more questions currently, um, but if you have any questions, you saw the web page, you can email me or you can ask on Twitter, whatever you want. Um, the um, the idea would be now to have a small break um, for 20 minutes and then Gerhard would take over. I hope that was helpful and um, somebody should take away the um, presenter mode for me and give it to, to Gerhard. Thank you very much.